It's good to be together, isn't it? It's my privilege to uh, introduce our speaker for the first session of the conference, uh, and that is Julian Richards. And that's probably all I need to say, really, isn't it? In many ways, we all know who Julian is. He leads uh, New Wine Cymru and has done so for the last decade or more. And I think it's fair to say, but it's good to remind ourselves sometimes of what God has done among us in the last decade. It's extraordinary how many leaders have connected with the work of New Wine Cymru, how many churches have been uh, engaged and inspired and encouraged and changed as a result of, of, of the work of New Wine Cymru. And, and much of that wouldn't have been possible had it not been for Julian's apostolic leadership, which has kept us focused, kept us moving forward, even through the COVID times, and they haven't been uh, easy for any of us, have they? But Julian, we're thankful and grateful for your leadership, and can I encourage you to welcome him now as he comes and ministers in this first session. Thank you, Julian. tonight <laughs> will ever deserve and a great word this morning what do you want me to do for you well back in the days when I thought a 40 year old was an old person <laughs> and we had young kids uh, we, had to, we had to get a new car we had a limited budget and so I did all the hunting and the searching and visiting the garages and Eventually, after a long haul, I found a car that was within the budget. It had a relatively low mileage, it had a full service history, it was in good condition, there was no rust, the wheels went round, it worked. And I, was, I thought, this, this is great, this is perfect for us. But, but obviously, I had to bring Sarah to have a look at it because she was going to drive as well and she'd be in the passenger seat and it had to work for her and be comfortable. So I brought her down to the garage and I was in the driver's seat and she sat in and I said, Sarah, look at this car. It's got low mileage, full services, great set of tyres. It's a great price. We can afford it. It's so perfect for our family. It's going to work. This is, this is the perfect car. What do you think? It doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, but the mileage is great, and the service history is good, and it's, it's a really good car. It feels like it's been owned by a visitectonist, which is basically somebody who does experiments on animals. <laughs> well, evidently, Obviously, we didn't buy the car. So, a number of years later, when a 40-year-old isn't an old person, but now, for me, a 40-year-old is a young person, <laughs> I went and looked for a car, and again, found this great car that I thought would suit us perfectly well, and it was in Cardiff, mind. I mean, it wasn't Bagland Bay's Backstreet Motors. It was in Cardiff. I mean, this is like where proper car dealerships are, you know, where you, you travel to go and get a decent car. So I found this car, and I thought, well, this has got to be the one. This is great. I mean, this is a perfect car. So, Sarah, you've got to come and check the car out. So we drove all the way down from, you know, Swansea to Cardiff, got our passports ready and everything, all the way down there. And there we were, same thing, I'm in the driver's seat, she's sitting in the car. So what do you think? It's perfect, this is a great car. And she said, it feels like it's been driven by a sweaty man eating cheese and onion crisps. <laughs> so, uh, funnily enough, it was a demonstrator. And when a sweaty man actually eating cheese and onion crisps came over to ask her what we thought of the car, she felt vindicated. <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't buy the car. Isn't it strange how we can go through life, sit in the same seat, look at the same things, come out with different conclusions? Have you noticed that? And it's because our experience, no matter what our experience is, whether it's good or bad, difficult or amazing, 
It actually speaks to us. It informs our thinking. It calibrates who we are. It defines us and shapes us. And so it causes us to see things and view things with a different perspective. And you can have people who are going through exactly the same thing, the same experience, but come to totally different conclusions. And Jesus said, be careful how you listen. Not just to the things that we hear from the mouths of others, but be careful how our experience speaks to us. Because our experience does speak to us. Our words have the power to influence and determine our outcomes, and so do our various experience. And how we listen to our experience, as well as the words to others, determines what we hold on to and what we lay hold of. What we hold on to and what we lay hold of. Listen to this. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have what they have will be taken from them in the context of considering how you listen. How you listen determines what you hold on to and what you let go of. So I'd like to share a story from the scripture. and I've, it's, got, it's repeated over a number of occasions in the book of Numbers and I've amalgamated it so we can get the idea And so, here's two groups of people who are experiencing the same things and come to totally different conclusions. And it'll be familiar to you. Here's the background. Uh, The Israelites had been in Egypt for 430 years. Uh, They came down there as shepherds. Uh, In the beginning, it was great. They did their shepherding thing, and they were very fruitful. Then a new pharaoh came on the throne and began to oppress them and turn them into slaves, and they had a hard time. And then Moses delivered them, and they went through the Red Sea, but that was a trauma because the thundering Egyptian armies were behind them, and the Red Sea was before them, and they thought, we are going to die in this. And in that moment, before the... I mean, even Moses in that moment was behind the rock playing, what do I do? And God said, get up, Moses, and put your staff out and part the sea. But it was a moment of trauma and fear for them. Then they went into the wilderness, not a great place to live, wilderness, barren, dry, hard, arid. They were, they were thirsty because of food with no water, and they came across the wells, and the water was bitter, so it was poisonous. And then, what are we going to do? We're going to die. And then, you know, that got sorted. But then they, they were hungry, and they craved meat, and they wanted to go back, and they, they said, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And they went through challenge after challenge after challenge, and hardship after hardship, as they were pursuing the promise and the purposes of God. And then they came to Mount Sinai, And there was the clouds and the smoke and the lightning and the thunder and it freaked them out. And they said, let's not go there or we will die. And all of this spoke into their consciousness and begin because they had been experiencing extreme challenge and hardship on pursuit of the journey. And now they came to the verge of the Jordan and Moses sent out 12 spies to spy out the lands so they could enter into the promise And here's what they said. Ten spies came back. And they said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. They're spread out amongst, and then they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. The land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people live there are powerful And the cities are fortified and very large. And the people we saw of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. And besides that, there were sweaty men there eating cheese and onion crisps. (laughs) And Joshua and Caleb stepped up having listened to this. They said, the contrast... The land we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. The Lord will lead us into the land of, and flowing with milk and honey. And he will give it to us. Don't be afraid of the people of the land. Their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. We should go up and take possession of the land and buy that car. 
We can certainly do it. Two contrasting opinions, but they smelled the same air, they felt the same experience, they looked at the same people, they examined the same cities, they walked into the same fields, they saw the same fruit, same experience, different conclusions, and how it determined their future. Wandering for 40 years, And the Lord said, only those under 20 years will actually possess the land because of their unwillingness to cross over and take it because they listened to the bad report, as the scriptures put it. Only Joshua and Caleb will go over. Why? Because they had a different spirit. Their response to what they saw, their response to what they heard through their experience, was different. Be careful how we listen. Consider our responses. It's so easy, isn't it? If you're anything like me, and I guess you are, to be sucked into unbelief, discouragement, persuaded by our disappointments, shaped by our past experience through the tough times, can be really depleting. And when we're depleted, we kind of lose faith and hope and vision. We get stuck and we have these self-defeating mindsets. Have you ever battled with that? I'm sure you have. I know I have. We have, haven't we? And I know that through the challenging years and the COVID years, we have had to... Be careful how we respond and how we listen to our experiences because it can be depleting and self-defeating. And this passage of scripture, it shows us typical human responses and the lenses that we put on when we go through tough times. Remember, they'd gone through 40 years of a tough time and now they were into a challenge and an opportunity. So here's some of the lenses. They can have... Grasshopper lenses. We were like grasshoppers in this life. What does that? A grasshopper lens is we feel weaker. We feel smaller. We feel inferior. We compare. They're big, we're small. They're massive. We're little. They can do it, we can't. And that's what we do. That's what hardship goes through. It speaks to us. And it causes us to hear differently and respond differently. I've left, I've, I've left conferences like this, great conferences, with amazing testimonies and stories of how churches have grown from like one to a million in three weeks. <laughs> you know, amazing speakers, massive reach, great churches. And all these amazing stories, I've been in conferences and heard those great things and have left discouraged. How can you leave discouraged? Because the hardship you're in and hearing the story sometimes compounds the pain and it's depleting and it causes us to let it speak to us in a way that comes self-defeating. Let me say something that might encourage you. That didn't encourage me at the time. Let me say something that might encourage you. Um, in pioneering our church, Cornerstone Church, it was seven years before our first new convert stuck. That's discouraging, isn't it? Seven years before our first convert stuck. Oh, we have people who make professions of faith and they come for a bit and then they'd stop, or they never came at all. But what I mean by a com- somebody who came to faith, joined the church, became part of the community, and are still with us today, fruit that remains. Seven years. How discouraging is that in the first seven years? That experience can speak to you, can speak to me. You've gone through that, haven't you? You know what that's like, because we've all walked through this same desert It can produce discouragement and doubt. Beware of the grasshopper lens of comparison. It doesn't do us any good. 
And then there's the 45 lens. The cities are like 45. They are massive and strong. What's that? Well, it's the lens where the task is too difficult. It's too strong for you. The challenge is inflated. I can't do it. We can't do it. It's too big. We're just shepherds. And now you want it to take a nation. I remember when God asked us and we felt led to buy a building and we'd all serve the community here and there, but almost to set up more expansive programs. And we started, like many of you, with no money and no skills of making it up as we went along. <laughs> you know, and we started with a couple of kids, you know, and we were working. And, and I remember walking through the, through the reservoir, not through the reservoir, I wasn't, not that, I haven't got there yet, Walk, but around it, you know. Although we can always hope. But um, I remember saying, to the Lord, I don't have what it takes to do this. We don't have enough money. We don't have any, enough skilled workers. We just don't have the skills to do it. And you're asking us to do this building and develop community projects and etc. We don't have it. And I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, as you need it, I will provide it. But I would have much rather have provided it before we needed it. <laughs> Doesn't work like that, does it? <laughs> And then there's the giant-sized lenses. I don't mean big glasses, but we're looking at giants. These, these things that stand before us that actually intimidate us and overwhelm us and make us feel not just small, but fearful, intimidated, Goliaths. And they intimidate us into silence like the Israelites were before the shouting Goliath. And I, that passage of scripture where they just stood there. I mean, the whole army stood there and didn't move before the Goliath of one man. Paralyzed into intimidation, silence through fear. And, and the inability to move forward and take a risk. I mean, maybe if we all run away all at the same time, we might defeat this thing. But it was against the rules. Because <laughs> the only one could do it. One on one. So, so there's giants in our lives. Often those giants are in form of people. They might not be shouting, but they might have a strong spirit. What right have you got to do this? What right have you got to preach this? What right have you got to bring this vision? What right have you got to bring this change? What right have you got to speak to me like that? What have you, right have you got to, to uh, uh, talk to me about an issue that might be unhelpful? What right, what right, what right? We all feel like that. Well, I feel like that right now. Right now, I feel like that. But I'm only doing it because he's asked me to. And that's the same for you. You're not doing it because you're up yourselves. You're doing it because he asked you to. Because you're called to. But we have these giant-sized challenges that sometimes are tasks and Sometimes the projects, sometimes the landscapes before us, the co- and we have fear of losing people, finance, failure, reputation. Sheesh. It's not a great place to live, but we battle with these things. And we, we have this mindset sometimes that the Israelites, I think, had, because they were shepherds after all, when they said, Joseph said to Pharaoh, my people are shepherds. They've been shepherds. They wandered through the wilderness of shepherds. And now, they say, I don't want to be a warrior. I'm a shepherd. And we can see ourselves through our history rather than our destiny. Just let me look after these few sheep, you know, my tribe. I can't see myself taking territory. That's how they felt. And that's the condition that they stayed in. This is a sad text. The Lord says, but as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years. Your children will be shepherds 40 years, suffering because of your unwillingness to go over. But, there's a great but, isn't there? But God took those shepherding children and turned them into shepherding warriors. 
God took shepherding children and turned them into shepherding warriors that crossed over and took the land. And God can turn shepherds today, pastors, teams, elders, small group leaders, worshipping shepherds, youth shepherds, Sunday school shepherds. He can take shepherds today and turn them into shepherding warriors that can change a landscape and change our destiny. He's melted the hearts in our nation. Now, I was called into ministry 40 years ago. That's a long time, isn't it? Let me tell you, in the 80s, 1982, I was called into ministry and saved. In the 80s, the landscape, spiritual landscape, was a desert. For the last 40 years, you could say the church, the people of God in our nation and in the UK have been walking in a desert. I remember starting door-to-door work. Somebody got hold of me. I'd been a Christian about three weeks. It was approaching the summer. They'd had a missional campaign. Come and do door-to-door with me. I was too stupid and naive to say no. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. Not, not, what am I doing here? Slam, no, 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 conversation. I thought when it was over, what a relief. I don't want to do that again. I mean, it's just so depleting and discouraging, and I didn't enjoy it a bit. And then a friend of mine said, oh, I've been invited to go and do a mission for a month of door-to-door work in Ireland. And of course, when you're a new Christian, you haven't learned to say no yet. <laughs> You've got to say yes to everything, don't you? you know, and will you pray? Yes. Put it on your prayer list. Will you pray? Yes. I had a prayer. I'd blink hours before I could get, get out of my... <laughs> you know what it's like until you wise up and said... So. Anyway, I went into door-to-door work. Door-to-door work for a whole month in Ireland. Let me tell you this. I got one abiding memory of it, a decent conversation with a backslidden Jehovah Witness. I started doing street work. All I could hear from the back of the crowd is, let's get bricks and throw them at them. <laughs> that one guy, he wanted to punt, beat the living daylights out of me. Hard, a desert. Do you remember the days when we did events, evangelistic events, outreach events for our community, and only the church would turn up? We'd encourage us, oh, it was a good number, we didn't really like to think it was only us. <laughs> you remember the times you'd be in a party as a social gathering and say, what do you do? Or what did you do on Sunday? Oh, I went to church or I'm a minister or a pastor or whatever. And they go, oh, lovely. Drink anyone? <laughs> do you remember the times when we would do projects and they would say, we don't fund religious projects? Do you remember those days? Yeah, we, some of us do. Do you remember that sometimes our communities didn't want us? When we bought our, our first building in Penland, we had a big press campaign not wanting us. We had people knocking on our doors saying we're not wanted. I was hiked into a meeting on the street opposite where our building is now with the community group. The whole community, all the residents and the local councillors had all come to grill me because they said, we don't want another church here. There's one over there. What do we want another one for? And I went, sat down, and I looked up in the corner. In the corner, I was being videoed. I mean, this is the day when they only had camcorders. But they were trying, and they said, but the thing is, (laughs) they made a big mistake. They said, what do you want to do with that place? Well, that's a dangerous question for visionaries. (laughs) But they didn't want us. Do you remember the days we worked endlessly and churches would, They wouldn't grow. Be careful how we listen to our past experiences. Don't let our hardship and disappointments speak another story other than the one that God is writing. Don't let the lack of people, the rejection, the lack of fruit say it can't be done. I can't do it. We can't do it. Don't let the times you've preached and they didn't listen speak to you. Don't let the time when they listened but didn't respond speak to you. Don't let the time when they listened 
and responded, but didn't stick, speak to you. Don't let COVID speak to you. I've stolen your people, your volunteers. You've lost your fruit. I've taken your resources. Because there's a different narrative to own. Some have walked through the land beyond the doors of our church or Zoom meetings and have discovered out there in the real world that people are living in, there's more fruit than we can carry home. There's more people who are responsive and open that can fill our buildings. Hearts have melted. The guard is down. Their protection is gone. Gone. God has gone before us. Closed hearts are beginning to open. A little while ago, just before Christmas, I was going to the supermarket to do some shopping, and there was a big issue sales lady, and I looked at her, and she just looked in terrible physical pain and distress. And I went up to her, and I said, not to buy a big issue, but I said, are you okay? And then she began to complain how she had a back problem, uh, inner spine, all going down her legs. She's had it for years and years. She said, the doctors want to put an injection in my spine, but I'm so frightened about it. And I said, let me pray for you, because in our church we pray for people like that, and they often get healed. Would you like me to pray for you? And she said, yes. So I took her to one side, just outside, away from the door, and uh, I asked her name. She says, Anna. And I said, Anna, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, heal me now. And she said, Lord Jesus, heal me now, holding her big issues. And I said this. I said, I was going to pray, Father, heal her. But I said, Father, Father, thank you that you love Anna. And as soon as I said that, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon her. She burst into tears. She was totally healed. And all the pain went. And what I didn't realize, what I didn't realize is that she was suffering from a terrible chest infection at the same time through, with, and, and taking antibiotics. And her fever went and her chest, whew, she could breathe again. So I went back a few days and said, how are you? She says, I feel great. So will you tell me that in 30 seconds because I want to make you world famous. <laughs> uh, so um, I put her on, you, on uh, my phone. We st streamlined it for our Christmas service. Just before our Christmas service, I'm down the gym. Uh, and I meet a, fr a friend of mine, Jez. Not Jez, the operations manager. Jez, he goes down the gym. And uh, he says, oh, it must be a busy time of you, year for you, Julian, because, you know... Um, he knows what I do. And when I was talking about what I do uh, about a year ago before, he says, oh, you're not trying to convert me, are you? So I really had to back off, you know, because uh, his heart wasn't there or open. And I said, yes, yeah, a busy time of year for me. He said, but uh, we can't meet uh, as we normally do, but we're live streaming our services. Oh, great, I'll watch it. So I sent him the code. He watched it, and he watched Hannah get healed. Down the gym next time. What I didn't know is his wife had a growth in her spine, next to her spine, that she'd had for years. And she was in agony every day. And she couldn't, she couldn't go upstairs. She couldn't sit up without pain. She couldn't walk without pain. She'd, uh, she'd already booked for surgery. But because it was so close to the spinal cord, she backed out of it last minute because she was in danger of being paralyzed. Very risky operation. And she, but, but now, years later, it was so bad she was going to have the surgery. She said, would you pray for my wife? Uh -huh. I thought you wanted me to back off. Would you pray for my wife? And he said, you know, go home and pray. I said, I tell you what's better. If you let me come to your house and pray for her. Uh, tell her about me, you know. And see, she goes, I never thought she'd say yes. Because, you know, can you imagine going home? I met this guy, in, you know, like weird. <laughs> well, she said, yes, she's so desperate. I said, tell her, it'll only take 10 minutes at the max. And she said, and she said, will it take 10 minutes? Yes, take 10 minutes. Okay, come on now. So I went to his house, walked in. She sat there, prayed for her. She got healed. All the pain went up and down the stairs, walking out the stick, everything. Totally healed. She's been back to the doctors, and they're not going to operate. Now, hearts are being opened. Hearts are being melted. Seeds that have been sown are germinating. About five years ago, in the gym, young man, Marcus, in his 20s, I chatted to him a few times. I said, surely, Lord, you've got something to say to this young man. Give me a word, a prophecy, a picture, like I would not church for church members, but I can just give to Marcus, just to encourage him. 
So I got something about his uh, school life, and he's in his mid-twenties. I got something about his school life. I said, Marcus, I know that's much strange, but you know, you we're friends. Well, you know what I do, and I pray for my friends, and sometimes when I pray for my friends, I get a sense that God might have something to encourage them, something to say. Would you like to hear it? Yes, please. Not Christian. Yes, please. I'd speak to him, uh, talking about his childhood, what he's like in school, things he got in trouble for, well, he was blown away. And then I began to talk to him about how, how God had more for him and there some of the skills and the talents and he's particularly good with youth and all those types of things. He said, oh, that's made my day. Well, I never heard a, a word for about a year and then we went into COVID. Now, maybe three years later, go down the gym, COVID's open, we're back. Marcus comes up to me one Sunday morning as I'm just doing some exercise before we go to church early in the morning. He comes up, oh, Julian, just the man I need to see. I've started praying. <laughs> and he began to ask me questions about prayer. And would God hear him? And does he need to keep praying for the answer? And I said, do you want me to be blunt and totally truthful with you, Marcus? Yes, please. I, so then I talked to him, how about how our sins and wrongdoings separate us from God so he doesn't hear us. And then I preached the cross, tell him about Jesus, and said, would you like to turn from what you know to be wrong, give your life to Christ? And he gave his life to Christ right there, right next to the weight rack. <laughs> Hearts are being opened, seeds are being germinated. Right now, because God goes before us. And this was in COVID, and I hadn't seen him for three years, or two years, sorry. Atheists. Another friend, I go down to the gym, partly to keep fit, partly to make friends. Another friend of mine, atheist. Every time I see him, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist. He's a really intelligent, he's a linguist, he, speaks, he reads Latin and Greek and ancient languages, and listens to Mozart. I don't know what he's doing in Gosain and Jim, but that's where he lives. <laughs> so he keeps coming up to me and asking me questions. He says, uh, in his typical response is this, not trying to catch you out, June. It's not a trick question. I said, look, I know, Simon, it's not a trick question. It's okay. You know, what is it now? He said, he says, in the Lord's Prayer, why does it say, <laughs> in the Lord's Prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, why does it say, our Father which art in heaven. And then he goes to talk to me about the Greek superlative and the personal pronoun and all that type of thing. And he says, because you could, you could actually call it our Father, who art in heaven. Why does he say which art in heaven, which isn't personal rather than personal? And I'm thinking, well, to be honest, I haven't studied the Greek and I'm not a Greek scholar, Simon, but I'll give it a bash. Uh, I think it could be two things. One, they said which art in heaven because it might be referring to uh, the father as the uh, father of the Godhead and therefore it's speaking about the Trinity and the divinity and as we know God is not male or female so it's taking the neutral term because it's talking about that. Or it could be the fact that when that version which was the King James Version was written in the 17th century uh, theology was interpreted, the nuances, within your culture. And if there was two, two ways a word could land on, they would interpret it into the culture. So the culture in the 17th century that was God as distant and transcendent and out there and awesome, and we could not approach it. But, so they choose which, which is not personal. But today, people uh, of focused on the transcendence and the personal nature of God. He's very personal, he's very close to us. It's more about, it's about a relationship. And so modern translations, which you might not have read, have who in heaven? And he went, good answer. <laughs> well, I thought it was quite a good answer, actually. <laughs> that was lucky. <laughs> good answer. And he toddled off to carry on with his exercises. But we're on ongoing conversation about faith and theology. Why? Because God has softened the hearts of people. Young people are responding. A teacher recently came to show us a video that she'd taken, sneak, you know, in a, in a classroom of, or of, a, of another teacher in the room streaming our Sunday live stream service to the kids. And they're all singing the songs. We've just done a, a Jesus Life, you know, showing kids about faith in the school, and 45 kids turn up to the first Alpha. 
we just baptized six people in their 20s. One a, one a young mother in her 20s and six youngsters. And they all said, a friend brought me along. I went to an Alpha, I came to the church, I liked church, I went on Alpha, I went on Alpha, I liked the church, and they all stuck. Why am I saying sharing these stories? Because there's a spiritual openness. God has gone before us. Recently, Andrew, um, who uh, leads the Valleys, West Valleys region, and Beth Sharp, who's speaking in one of our seminars, she heads up uh, Youth Alpha in Wales, we went up to see Mark Williams and his team from the Bible Society to talk about missional literature in this present season that we're in. And they were talking about a survey that they'd done called Spiritually Open. And they discovered through the survey that our nation is spiritually open to Jesus and an exploration of faith. And he said this. I'm sitting next to the chief executive of the Bible Society after the research. And he says this. He says, our nation has never been so spiritually open in the last 40 years. And I said, I agree. Because people and people have gone to the other side, have come back with a report. No, you don't. (laughs) What's to verify my account details in Spotify? (laughs) Don't you realise I'm doing something, I'm very busy right now. Oh, it started again, shut up. (laughs) Sorry about that on live stream. He's gone before us. And he's melted hearts and he's inviting us to go where he is. God, in this season, as he's done in the past, can turn physically, emotionally tired shepherds into shepherding warriors. He can. And it's not about trying harder. Trying harder isn't going to do it. It's not pushing harder or trying harder or hyping it up. We don't want hype. Do you know when we hear hype, if everything like me, I feel deflated. But, but the thing about our difficulties is that we have to be careful that we don't let go of vision and we don't let go of faith and we don't get low of, let go of hope. Because if we let go of hope, our hearts become sick and we remain in an unhealthy place. If we, if we let go of vision, it deteriorates us. Without vision, we perish. We, we, it deteriorates us. And we must let go of faith because these are the stream for which hope, which is so healing and recovering, and vision, which is so energizing, comes from. The evidence, uh, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. The vision set before us. And faith is what we hold on to. Not trying harder, but hold on to faith. What we see by faith interprets our experience. It changes the landscape. It writes a different narrative. And it determines our future. When Roger Bannister, May the 6th, 1954, broke the four-minute mile, it took, hundreds, well, it took thousands of years. It never been done before. So even from the first Olympic Games, nobody had ever done it. But when it was seen on TV, that Harrogate moment, he only kept the record for 46 days. Because when people saw it could be done, everything changed. Caleb and Joshua didn't just see giants and cities and resistance. They saw God had opened up the land. And those spies, sorry, those new spies that had wandered in the desert for 40 years, they also went across the land and came back with a report. And they said this, their hearts have melted. Whilst we've been singing about taking our land for Jesus in the 80s, God now has gone before us behind our backs and melted the hearts of people and they are spiritually open. Humans look back to the past and conclude the future is a repeat. But if we see what God has done, a new future unfolds. So as I close, those shepherds that wandered for 40 years shepherding in the wilderness had now grown up. And those shepherds became officers, military officers, shepherding Warriors that mobilize God's people. 
Joshua commanded his officers to go through the camps and commanded the people saying, prepare provisions for yourself for in three days you will cross over the Jordan and go to possess the land for the Lord your God is giving it to you. What if pastors and elders and leaders and small group leaders and worship pastors and small group, what if the whole shebang, what are those of us here in this room today Shepherds that have wandered through the 80s and the 90s and the barrenness and the wilderness and the disappointment and working harder but almost feeling as if it's fruitless. What if, what if pastors prepared our people, our tribes to mobilize in mission? Each church What if we went home because we've seen a different landscape, because we've allowed faith and hope to be rekindled, because we've seen that God has gone before, and we don't allow our past to dictate to our response, but we allow faith to write a different landscape? What What if we had the courage to do that? And we went home and saying, we are now officers. We're officers and shepherds, and we're shepherding warriors. And it's now a time to mobilize our congregations because we can't do it on our own. It's the whole tribe that need to do it. And we mobilize our congregations to become missional churches from congregational members on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, not just down to what we do corporately or individually, but we're mobilizing the whole lot. And every church becomes missional in DNA in church, within its own church style within its own personality, within its own value system and its theological nuance. Not one size fits all, not squeeze into a mold, not all doing it at the same time like Mission to Wales, although if God tells us to, we can, but that's not what we're talking about here. But what if right across our nation there was 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 churches who actually became missional in nature rather than just pastor-teacher in nature that did mission occasionally, but actually became missional in nature, which is New Testament, that pastor teaches. Mission, go into the world, proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, teach. Go into the world, teach. Not teach, go into the world. Go into the world, teach, disciple. A missional movement that taught and pastored and discipled. What if we didn't think it was overwhelming? What if we, do, we weren't intimidated anymore? What if we realize that the guard is down, the hearts are melted? What if we realize that as we go and speak and heal and pray and prophesy and love and serve and invite, people go, all right then, I'm happy to journey with you. Let's have another conversation. Yeah, I'll come along. Oh, I like this. I'll try an alpha. Yeah, I'll try an alpha. Oh, I think I like you. I might come to church. What if we left this place saying with a new intentionality, Together, helping one another, we actually created, with God's help, cultures of mission within our church, where congregational members were mobilized for friends and neighbors and communities, for towns and cities and villages. Not because we have to, not because it's another, oh, not another thing I must do. That's not going to last. We're not going to be able to sustain that. But But because it's in us, because we have seen that God has gone before us. We've seen the hearts that have melted because faith has been deposited and faith energizes. Faith energizes. Faith renews because we know God has melted hearts, because he's removed their guard, because their protection's gone, because we know God has been at work behind our backs and gone before us, Because we can see by faith a better spiritual landscape from the one we've been wandering in. What if we decided from this conference to become shepherding warriors like David? I think we could. And I think God can recalibrate us. Let's stand together. If you feel excited, I think that might be the Lord (laughs) putting an excitement within you because who would get excited by such a thing?
If you feel convicted, hopeful, if you feel a recovery of faith, it comes from God faith. Or if this is something you just want to be and want to do, why don't we just take a moment and respond to the Lord before the band lead us in a song to respond as well and say, Lord, today I add to my shepherding mantle the mantle of a warrior. Like David and Gideon in the field, I choose to by faith believe that you have made us, me, a mighty warrior. And the battle is not mine, it is yours. And you have already gone before us. So help me as a pastor and pastors and leaders in the church to create a new missional go, win, invite, share, bless, lead to Christ, disciple culture. Of not the existing people, but the new harvest that you want to bring in. Come and do this amongst us now, Lord, we pray. And hear every heart and every desire. And by your spirit, we calibrate our thinking so that we can go where you are. Amen. Let's respond in worship now. It's that amazing word that God is calling us to more. This song talks about building our life on Jesus and showing his love to others. That God would lead us to do that. So let's use this song as a prayer of response to God today. of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh Jesus Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. others and there's a whole nation waiting to hear about you and all across the world and we ask Lord that this passion will burn once again in us so we have the faith stir in us Lord that we're not frightened of the giants but we see the potential and we see what you are doing in our nation we thank you for the warmth among people we thank you for the openness and as a people here Lord we decide to step in and lead our communities with us, that we will lead the way on this fresh adventure. And Lord, we ask that you'll fill our hearts again, that we may know your strength, that we walk into this fresh season with strength, strength in our spirit. Revitalize us, Lord. Heal us from the things that we have been through, that we may walk with strength, Thank you, Lord, for your love. You are amazing to us. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great. Let's take our seats. Well, let's give Julian a round of applause. That was a great first message. That's it. Thank you, Julian. And our um, theme for the conference, you may have seen the chilly theme going on, and I'm sure some of you will have worked it out, and some of you just won't even have noticed or thought that reminds me of dinner. But uh, the reason we did chilies, they're very small, but they're packed with power. And you and I might be small, we might be a small nation, but with God's help, we have amazing power.